Like imagine if with hard work and discipline, where the game of basketball can take you as you continue to go through your lives. Believe in yourself, trust yourself, and be your biggest fan and your biggest advocate. And, and ultimately, you'll never really lose if you overcome fear by trying. A lot of um, tackling challenges is looking at the glass half full instead of half empty. It's looking at things with a positive um, outlook. It is okay to be different. Um, it is okay to be you. Because who is Batuli? Um, a Guinean, you know, Muslim, an, an American, um, a Yukon alum. But to give back to a community you grew up in, it means the world because you um, are living your dream and you're, you're able to see yourself and the kids that you're actually working with in the exact playgrounds, the exact school, so it means a lot. No one gets where um, he or she is alone, but you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. It is my great honor to welcome our founder and executive director of Shooting Touch, Lindsay Kittredge. Share your questions, don't be afraid. This is an incredible opportunity with all these panelists here tonight and hopefully all of us can walk away feeling so inspired and um, ready to tackle tomorrow and what our goals are. So um, without further ado, here is our magnificent moderator, Ms. Marissa Mosley. Please hold your applause. No, keep it coming. Stop, stop, it's too much. No, more, more, I need, thank you, thank you. I have something for us to do. So turn your camera on because we're just gonna lean with it, rock with it real quick together, but, but I gotta be able to see you. So I need you to turn your cameras on so we can do this all together. And I'll tell you that I don't make TikToks. So I learned this especially for you all. So can you turn your cameras on? Okay. All right, so on the count of three, we're gonna uh, uh, mm, uh, 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 renegade. Everybody good? Okay, one, two, three. Renegade, perfect, thank you. Hand clap of praise for you all, that was phenomenal. <laughs> like Lindsay said, my name is Marissa Mosley and I'm the head women's basketball coach here at Boston University. I'm really grateful to be your moderator and, and to be able to um, kind of share with you this phenomenal panel that's assembled here tonight. Um, I hope that you guys realize how incredibly fortunate you are to be in the presence of these dynamic women. And I think it's really, really incredible too that this is just for you guys. You know, a lot of these Zoom calls and a lot of these panels that people have been doing during quarantine, it's open to the public. Everybody gets to kind of jump on if they want. And um, for, you know, Lindsay and Britt and Chloe and Ashley to put this together just for you guys, it's really, really special. And so I really want you to kind of soak it all in and take it in because um, this is one of those things that doesn't always come around um, that often in your life. So enjoy tonight. Um, and for me, since receiving this invitation, I've been incredibly excited. Um, like Lindsay said today, I was just bouncing off the walls. I was practicing because I'm a perfectionist. And so I just wanted things to go well tonight. But, um, you know, we are all products of our environment and we've all been shaped by the people um, and the mentors who've come into our lives. And so you guys are so lucky to have Shooting Touch and the people here in this room tonight who are now your mentors as well and are here to help you and help grow you through this process. Um, and one of the things I think is really cool is despite none of these women are playing pro anymore. Um, you know, some have, right? Allison has played pro, but they've gone on now and, and Esther played overseas, but um, you know, for them now, they've actually used be uh, basketball um, as a vehicle to get them um, to other places in their life. And basketball has really exposed them to a variety of opportunities um, and prepared them to be successful. So just so you don't think like the only road to success is playing pro, these women are a great testament to you can come through basketball and become anything that you want to be. The lessons that you're going to learn through the game are just so incredibly valuable. Um, and I just want you guys to think about like imagine if with hard work and discipline, where the game of basketball can take you as you continue to go through your lives. I wanted to do something like so great for you guys so that you really understood how special myself and the rest of us think that you are. This tonight, these panelists, they are ready to play and I'm gonna about to you know, introduce them in the best way I know how. So without further ado,
she hails from Chester, South Carolina. A graduate of Harvard, she was the first athlete of any sport to be honored three times as the Ivy League Player of the Year and led the first number 16 seeded team to beat a number one seeded team in the NCAA tournament. A 10 year veteran of the WNBA who also competed overseas. She currently is the director of player development for the Boston Celtics. Give it up for Allison Feaster. Those students got some hype now. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Next up, she hails from Hyde Park, a hometown girl, a standout athlete while attending Boston Latin. She played her college ball at UMass Lowell before becoming a police officer. The superintendent of the Boston Police Department, only the fourth woman to ever hold that position, a great friend of Shooting Touch. Give it up for Nora Baston. A native of New York City who credits much of her success to her Ghanaian roots. She began her career at Kentucky University and then transferred to UConn, where I had the pleasure of coaching her. She has played on a national stage while using her platform to teach the importance of female empowerment. She has written a book, given a TED Talk, and created a nonprofit, a true inspiration, Batuli Kamara. And last but not least, a native of Springfield, Massachusetts, my hometown. She picked up a basketball at the age of 15 and shortly thereafter earned a Division I scholarship to Bailey Dickerson University and then went on to play in England. A lover of art, recognized the importance of representation for women in sports creator of those shirts that so many of you rock and love, founder and director of the Player Society. Give it up for Esther Wallace. Now listen, I might not have a voice tomorrow, but that was for you guys. I did it for you. That was awesome. <laughs> it was on my bucket list so thank you thank you for allowing me to do that we are all here tonight to for these women these dynamic women to really give you guys an opportunity to hear about their journeys their stories some of the things that they have encountered on their way to success and the road to success is not a straight line always and there's ups and downs and pitfalls at times and um, I think they are incredibly inspirational and I'm really excited for you guys to hear what they have to say. So we're going to first start with Allison Feaster and Allison, uh, we want to just talk to you a little bit about what it's like for you and what it's been like for you to break down barriers in your career and what are some of the challenges that you faced on your road to success um, and how have you overcome those? So first and foremost, um, I'm glad you, you know, approached this that way because a lot of um, tackling challenges is looking at the glass half full instead of half empty. It's looking at things with a positive um, outlook. Um, and I'm pumped. You know, I, I look back over my career and life and I can barely even put my finger on the, the difficult times, but I know I went through them, obviously. But, you know, you really have to, to take things with a positive attitude. That's first and foremost. Um, with that said, yes, there were challenges. Um, I grew up in a family that was a low income family. My mom was the single parent. Um, she divorced my dad when uh, I was 10 years old and she kind of went off on her own. She didn't have a college degree um, and she had to you know, work and work two jobs to really struggle and, and fight to make ends meet. Um, so I think that was you know, a challenge, a, a circumstance. Um, then there was a certain inner fear that I probably had um, as I approached, you know, different stages in my life about whether or not I could, you know, kind of overcome things that were in front of me. Um, and then, you know, through managing those, that inner fear and, and having failed a couple of times, um, which is a part of life, obviously, 
but yeah, those, those are, I would say, the challenges that I faced. Um, but never, never, never really focused on um, the, what I didn't have. It was always what I was trying to do to work and what I was trying to work to achieve, mainly. So the, you would say that in order for, you know, these young girls, they're saying there's these, you know, pitfalls or challenges that they're taking. The biggest way that you could overcome those is, is keeping a positive attitude and not really focusing on the negative. First of, yeah, absolutely. I think we all come to the table with, um, with, with situations and with circumstances. We all are dealt us a particular hand and it's really what you do with that hand that, that makes you successful. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've failed at something uh, or not known the answer to something. Um, and it's, it would have been so much, so easy for me to kind of, you know, fold up and, 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 and cry about it or, or not get up and, and go pursue what, what I really wanted. Um, I was, I was on a panel the other day, just, you know, kind of reflecting on, I don't even want to call them failures. They were moments to learn from, um, where I might've come up a little short, I was in a, in a darker period of my career, not having any clue. I just finished playing, you know, basketball professionally for um, 17 years abroad in, in, in the States and had zero clue what I was going to do next to kind of make ends meet. And um, I wanted to be a foreign service officer. I took the foreign service exam and, you know, I aced the multiple choice part, the, I guess the theoretical part of the test. And when it came time to do the writing part, I had a mental block and did not complete the sample and hence failed the exam. And hence that door closed on um, that potential career that I was you know, convinced that I wanted to do. But um, as it turns out, it opened another door to being an ambassador, to being um, you know, volunteering for NBA at the grassroots level, and which later led to my job at the NBA which later led to my job with the Celtics. So um, you just got to keep fighting through it. Great. That's a great answer. It's so true, right? We, when one door closes, another door opens for sure. Um, as you progressed on this path, you know, uh, were there times where you felt like you were an outsider and, and how did you cope with that? Wow. Um, definitely felt like an outsider uh, at various stages in life. Um, I think first and foremost, I can remember being the second tallest girl in my fifth grade class. And uh, when we, we would arrive at school, I, we would have to walk down the hall and all the students would be, you know, seated outside um, their classrooms waiting for, you know, the, the opening bell where folks could go in and start school. And my best friend and I, who, who were the, you know, she was the tallest, I was the second tallest. We would always walk down this hall so self-conscious about the way we looked and what we were wearing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's when I was first conscious of being an outsider. Uh, later on in life, when I went to Harvard, I was, you know, the only African-American on my team at several points. Um, I was in my, you know, travels abroad, I might've been the only English speaker or the only American player um, when I was playing abroad in Europe. Um, so, and, and now, um, I'm the only female uh, in, in some meetings and only female, only person of color in some meetings. So definitely been the outsider, but have, I've definitely had practice and I've practiced myself um, and, and I've come to the table at each moment prepared and, and confident that the work I'd put in, you know, prior to, to arriving, that was my, my source of strength. So. That's incredible, you know, because I think it's, it's true. Um, it really touched me when you talk about being the tallest. I think a lot of us have experienced that and feeling self-conscious and uh, let you all on an, a little secret. Everyone is going to want your height uh, yeah. after this. They're going to constantly tell you how much they wish they were your height. So just own it now. It, it might feel like it's a struggle, but it's really a blessing. So um so last, um, you know, kind of wanted to, when we're talking about breaking barriers, um, can you describe the barriers that you had to break through in order to get to where you are today? Like, do you feel like obviously being, you know, an other, being a woman of color and all of that, but was, do you, was there a moment where you kind of decided, hey, listen, I'm not going to look at this as, um, like you said, a glass half empty. I'm going to look at this as an opportunity for me to maybe be the first and, and blaze a trail. 
I think definitely. I um, am very, very fortunate to have had a strong female role model in my mom and in my big sister growing up, you know, both really instilled in me the, the value of hard work and the value of getting an education, a strong education. Um, so I kind of led with that as a shield, um, you know, knowing that I'm worthy, knowing that I could do anything I wanted to do and understanding that all anyone could ask of me was to give my best. So um, with that in mind, I don't even see a barrier. Um, I, I see what's in front of me, but I don't lead with I'm different or I don't look like this person or they don't look like me, they don't think like me. Uh, to the contrary, to me, that is an asset. I bring something different to the table. Uh, so I don't see it in, t in terms of barriers. I see it as I belong because I've worked hard to get there. No one gets where um, he or she is alone, without a doubt. But you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. No, I think that's an incredible message. And, you know, I think one of the things and, um, you know, being humble is great, right? But I think one of the things that I really try to talk to my players about, and I think what you kind of demonstrated there is that really stepping into who you are and owning, you know, the power that you have as a woman and then as a woman of color and, and the opportunities that you really possess within yourself and, and not, you know, diminishing that or making it less for other people to feel comfortable. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay, so we're moving on to Nora. And with Nora, we're going to talk a little bit about how you find focus and motivation. So um, obviously you played, we talked about in your intro, you played um, at Boston Latin, played at UMass Lowell, but what motivated you to pursue a career in law enforcement? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you first of all for having me and, and Lindsay, thank you for always including me in the Boston Police, but um, what you don't know in my story and what I want to tell the kids and is that I, I went on to UMass Law as a walk-on, two things happened. I, I didn't pass my SATs, I didn't even get a 700 because I didn't believe in myself, I didn't apply myself, so I went on as a walk-on and within a year and a half later I was voted captain of the team. And I got six player off the bench and everything like that. But um, I worked at really being the worst player. And I don't think I ever, and Esther knows, she plays on my team now in the, in the league. I work at all the little things. So I'm not the most talented. I can't even hit a three. But no one's going to hustle more. No one's going to work hard more. No one's going to do the little things. And a senior, when she left um, senior year and I was getting off my red shirt, she grabbed me and she said, um, you know, she said, why, why are you here? Why do you play in the basketball team? And I said, oh, you know, she goes, because, um, you know, we thought you wanted to be the mascot. Are you here to play and apply yourself and learn all the things? Or are you here to just, everything's a joke and you're not taking it serious because that team sport and I was all about myself. I was all about doing a fancy move. I didn't care about anyone else in the court except me. And they really taught me that. And it, it actually changed my entire life. Um, to become a police officer because it helped me give me the tools to go onto a, a field that was male dominated, that didn't have many women, that you need to have that confidence, you need to have that believing in yourself. And I think um, carrying what I learned on the basketball court at UMass Lowell, and like you said, not doing it alone and having a team to really help you get through the hard times in the, that five years, because, because I redshirted, I went on and got a master's degree. So this is a kid that didn't even get into the school, didn't really think she could do it and have a group of female mentors that really just shaped me and made me believe that I can be anything. And I wasn't gonna become a police officer, but they, cause I thought it was too hard. And I said, if I can't pass a test, I'll make an apply pass the police test. And I just didn't have confidence. So it helped me get on. And it was like my dream because we had one cop in my neighborhood and he was not nice to us. And he thought because we were teenagers, we were always up to no good. And I always said, I'm gonna be a cop someday and I'm going to be a nice cop, and I'm going to be a mentor and a role model and all the things that I hope I am today. That's phenomenal, and uh, just a really, just a testament, right, to um, just given an opportunity and, and having the right type of people around you to continue to, to push you and mold you. Um, what does it mean to you to have this role in the city that you grew up in, right, and having a, a police officer in your neighborhood that motivated you to want to be, have a different affect and a different kind of personality, but What's it mean to you to really now, um, you know, represent the city that you grew up in? Oh, it, it, it means the world to me. And um, a few years ago, you know, Shoot and Touch actually brought out a lot of 
of myself and what I really wanted to do and give back because Lindsay knows and um, she had me come to, as like this, a guest speaker to speak to the kids at lunchtime, remember Lindsay? And um, after I got in my car and I watched what Suit and Touch was doing and really giving back and I'm like, that's what I always wanted to do and being a female athlete and a female you know, mentor and role model, I was limited to myself and I had the skill of basketball and what more can build relationships. You can be a mentor on the court and spend that time, that one-on-one -on -one time um, in your own community that you grew up in. I played BNBL on these courts. And for a kid that, like I said, I wasn't that good in high school. I had amazing um, players around me that went to like the ABL for you older people that used to be before the WNBA. And I just had to pass it to them. Um, so I wasn't really good. I got better later. And I got better because of all those little things that I was telling you about. But to give back to a community you grew up in, it means the world because you um, are living your dream and you're, and you're, and you're just feeling like you're, um, you're able to see yourself in the kids that you're actually working with in the exact playgrounds, the exact school. So it means a lot. That's great. That's great. We, we appreciate that. And it's, you know, it's, I think, refreshing for these young women and myself included to see someone who looks like them in a position like you and, and using your, your position to be able to give back. So we appreciate that. Um, just finally, um, you know, obviously you talked about some of the, the pitfalls and struggles that you came up, uh, came against, but what is, uh, what are some of the challenges in, as you're, you were rising in the ranks um, in a profession where typically females and minorities are, are really underrepresented and what are some of the obstacles that you feel Absolutely. like you faced in, in, uh, in that role? Absolutely. Um, like Allison was saying, you know, being in a job where it's, it's 87% male. Um, as I rose up through the ranks, I knew that was one way you could create your own opportunities. And that's what I want to tell the young kids. You know, you're given opportunities, but then you can put yourself in situations where you create your own by standing out and doing all those little things. So I used the skill of basketball. I actually just started playing basketball in a neighborhood and I started bringing the kids from the neighborhood up to UMass Lola to play with the girls. I said, you guys think you can play with guys? His girls and they all, everyone made fun of me. The police officers used to mock me and say, what do you carry a basketball in your car? And I actually got promoted with only 10 years on to the rank of deputy, literally from midnights in the wagons to walking and using the skill of a basketball to get me promoted. So it was that, and then to be in a world of, that was, I was the only female in that rank. It was very difficult because I didn't think I belonged. And because it was old school, police is very old school. I knew that I had to use the things that I used at Lowell, the confidence building, me believing in myself, me saying anything that I know that the standards were, I made sure I was in their criteria. So if the training was FBI school, I got FBI school. If the training was, Anything that they said, well, the guys do this because when you're a female, they look at you under a microscope. Everything is harder. If you, they're waiting for you to slip up. And what I try to do is I create opportunities for females now in the job. The mayor and the commissioner made sure that by promoting me to the fourth female, I think they wanted me and I hope that they wanted me to put myself in a position to create new opportunities for the younger generation and the females that come on. And that's why I created Women in Blue. All it is is a bunch of female athletes and it's just a bunch of positive female role models, but it gives them an opportunity to shine. And the obstacles in the department is for females who don't have that opportunity as much as the males. So I know in my new role, I try to put the females in the role and no more way can you shine than on a basketball court. Thank you so much for, you. for sharing those words. That was really, really incredible. Um, next up, we have Batuli, and Tuli's going to talk to us a little bit about short and long-term goals and a little bit about passion. And so, um, Tools, um, why don't you talk to these girls about what it takes to obtain your dreams and um, whether playing at UConn is the dream or your dream job? Uh -huh. Hey everyone, um, I'm so excited to see you all. I told my little sister that I would woe and she said she would disown me uh, for the rest of my life if I did. So I might do, but I, I don't know if y'all would rank me or anything. She said she would like never claim me. Will y'all rank me? Like just nod your head. Would you rank me in my woe if I did it? Like like this, tens, tens only. All right, I'll do it. It's like, <laughs> is it that bad? It's pretty good, right? <laughs> ten, 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 ten. I only take tens. <laughs> We got some harsh judges, but um, hi. <laughs> um, so, so what it takes for, for goal setting um, and coming to UConn. 
this was, I feel like I'm still living out my dream. Um, I just finished up my senior year uh, at, at UConn and at the age of 12, that's when I started playing basketball. Uh, I grew up in New York City uh, as a first gen student um, and my mom just knew about education. You know, that was the forefront of what she wanted for our life to be. She always tells me, she wants me to get, she has an accent. She says, but too, you have to get triple PhD. I'm like, triple? Like, how am I gonna get triple? <laughs> Oh, so she always said that to me. So that's how important education was. Um, but, but from a young age, I, I picked up the game and I absolutely loved it. Um, and, and the first part of goal setting, short or long, was soul searching. Do I really want to do this? Um, is this really for me? And it was after a practice. Um, I think everyone has had it, you know, where you run and you think you're going to die. Like, you're like, this coach is trying to kill me today. Like, how am I going to walk home? Um, and I loved it. I came back and, and I loved it. Um, and, and I said, I want to take steps every single day towards reaching my goal. Um, and so in the short term, it was, did I take a step today to, to reach my goal? Um, and for me, my goal was college basketball. And, and somewhere along the line, that was UConn. And, and that was amazing. And my biggest inspiration was Maya Moore. Um, and, and so I said, you know, if I can maybe do one thing that she does, I'd probably be in the league, but, <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, t taking those small steps for me, goal setting was a huge part of soul searching. Do I really want to do this? How can I take steps to doing that? And the second, having community um, and positive friends who led me in the right direction. And Tuli, to your point, right, for these young girls, like, that didn't necessarily, um, that, that type of a uh, advice applies whether you're trying to get to UConn or you're trying to get to your dream job or you're trying to you know become the best artist or best musician taking you know one little step each day towards your goals right so um obviously you're presenting right and you present as potentially to some folks as different mm -hmm. and so how do you own your differences and embrace being different I, I absolutely love that word. I think everyone should embrace that word different. Um, it, it is something that when I was younger, I remember I had a group of friends and they were like, we're going to skip practice today. And I did one time in my life. <laughs> and I had a long talk with my mentor and she said, you know, Batula, you are cut from a different cloth. It is okay to be different. Um, it is okay to be you. Because who is Batuli? Um, a Guinean, you know, Muslim, an, an American, um, a Yukon alum. And why would, why would I ever want to discount those experiences that I shared with amazing people? Um, whether that's the guy in the deli, like we have amazing experiences. Why would I want to discount that I'm from New York? So I think really accepting um, all of my experiences, um, saying that my, my sharing my story is sharing um, someone else's story. Uh, and that we are closer together that way. So through that and through continuous support from my family and friends um, and mentors and coaches to stay true to myself um, has allowed me to accept and to embrace being different. That's awesome. And um, just finally, what really sparked your, your interest in female empowerment? Because I know you, you, know, you started your um, nonprofit and I will tell you guys really quickly that Tuli uh, would come into my office and she would tell me, Riss, I have this, I, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And she was all over the place. And we really just tried to focus in. And so to see this come to fruition, um, I'm just so proud of her. But what, what, what really sparked your interest in that in the first place? I would say my mom. Uh, coming from a single parent household, I felt like my mom was superwoman. Um, and there was nothing that she, she couldn't do. Um, and, and it was so many more moments like that for me, uh, whether it was having, you know, coach Riss or seeing women and, you know, I always think about lunchroom, you know, the lunchroom is such an important part of middle school, which is confusing within itself. Every time you're in the lunchroom and something happens, I think if you just pay attention, majority of the people stepping up for others are girls, um, and, and strong young girls. And so that really, um, was kind of me shaping that outlook and seeing women at the forefront of incredible movements and, and doing amazing things. And so I always said, goodness, you know, I, I've been empowered by women and how can I do that for other young girls? How can I um, provide that space the way that others did for me? Um, and Ubuntu, you know, I am because we are and those who have come before me and those who come after me. Um, so I think it felt very natural and innate for um, me to work to empower women. 
Well, thank you so much. You really are an inspiration, especially at the age that you are to um, to really kind of be laying the groundwork. And I know there's some incredible things in your future and I just can't wait to, to see where you take this. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, last but not least, um, we're going to chat with Esther. And um, Esther, we wanna to talk to you a little bit about developing your network. Um, one of the things that my dad has pounded into my head since I was a kid was the, the importance of networking and how, you know, uh, you got to make sure that you network. And I was like 12 and I'm like, what does that mean, dad? Like, okay, I'm going to try. And it's, it's, it's incredible what networking can do. Networking has enabled me to be a part of this. And so um, can you kind of define for these guys what, what does that even mean um, to build a network and how have you gone about doing that? Hey everyone, I'm definitely happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, for me, networking is, um, I think it's kind of different for everyone, but in essence, it's having uh, a group of people that you can reach out to um, as resources. Uh, for me, that can even just be having people um, that I know and that I trust that are positive and bring positive energy around my interests, which is women's sports, women's basketball, and of course business, um, since I am a business owner. Um, so that's really what networking means to me. Um, the way that I've done it and gone about it is really finding people with shared interests and shared connections. Honestly, I find that being my authentic self whenever I can, um, that's when you're really able to connect with people and even, even if it's just for like five minutes that you meet somebody, you're able to make a connection. Um, oftentimes for me, that's through basketball, just talking about basketball. I meet somebody who's also interested in it and we form connections and then they're happy to kind of, um, they think of you uh, when, when something comes up, when there's an opportunity, they're like, oh, I met someone who, who you know, works with t-shirts and let me give her a call because this could be an opportunity for her. So that's really what networking is and it, it can open a lot of doors. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, you're right. It can open a lot of doors. And um, sometimes uh, when you are on the rise, um, you find people who will help, you know, support that. But then you also like need to figure out who's beneficial, um, just like for these guys, right? You got to find out who, what group do you want to be um, rolling with? Like who's going to be on your side and who, who do you think is maybe going to be um, someone that's a negative person to be with? So how do you feel like you can identify that? Um, you know, it always comes down to um, reading energy. I always kind of go back to, I think it was a Maya Angelou quote, which is when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. So really use your instincts and your judgment and understand like if, if someone's bringing negative energy around you constantly, then that's probably going to lead to negativity, um, a negative situation or, or something of that sort. And the same goes for positive energy. If someone's coming around with positive energy, then you can generally, you know, kind of um, put them in that category of being a positive person or being somebody that you, you can kind of keep in your circle. Um, you are kind of a culmination of who you surround yourself with. Uh, just listening to, you know, all the women on this panel, uh, there's always somebody in their community or somebody in their corner um, that they surround themselves with, um, whether it's family or friends that bring positive energy. So just knowing that that's, that's, those are the kind of people you want to be around. And to your point, who, who was that person for you? Who, who was someone specific that, you know, you felt like helped you um, to get in the right direction? Um, I, I've had uh, quite a few. Of course, my mom, my sister, you know, I was primarily raised by a single mom. Um, and she's raised two daughters with um, degrees and my sister works on Capitol Hill and I'm her number one fan. So um, I keep her in my corner a lot. But uh, early on, especially related to basketball, it was my, my AAU travel team coach. And he, he never made any of us girls feel like there was anything that we couldn't do or anything that we couldn't achieve. Even me um, starting when I was a sophomore in high school, starting to play basketball at that time, um, he, told, he was the first person to tell me that I could go and play in college. I could play at the division one level despite um, you know, having less experience. Or he told me how hard it would be. Um, 
and really I believed him and I bought in and I was willing to put in the work. And so he was the one that, that stood in my corner and pushed me. And if I wanted to go to the gym at 7 a.m. or if I wanted to go to the gym at 7 at night, he was there to help me um, get to, to where I wanted to be and achieve those goals. Thank you. That's, that's incredible, right? It just usually takes just one person to believe in you. And then the, the other part is you showing up and, and not letting them down because they showed that interest in you. You want to pay, pay it back to them. So um, let's give all of these incredible women a round of applause. That was phenomenal. Again, we want to thank you guys so much for giving us this time on a Thursday night. Uh, it's quarantine, so you don't have anywhere else to be, but we, you still chose to, uh, you know, sign up for this and sign in and give us your undivided attention. And for that, we are really eternally grateful. So um, we're just going to have each of the speakers and I'll go first, but we're going to kind of give you one last piece of advice. So my piece of advice is something that I actually just learned within the last week um, working with my team and trying to make them better leaders. And we're working with um, some special, former special forces guys. Um, and they were, they were, these are some bad dudes. They were over in Iraq and Afghanistan and um, they've trained and they've been undercover, but they're also incredible leaders. And one of the things that they said is, the standard you walk by is the new standard that you set. So again, the standard that you walk by is the new standard that you set, which means that you have to have high standards, but the minute that you let that standard drop and you walk past and, and, and let it go, you've now just set a new standard and it's lower than the initial one. So hold yourself to really, really high standards and don't ever let that fall below because the minute you do, now you have a new set standard. And I'm gonna throw it to Nara and have her tell us yeah. her one piece of advice. So yeah, my one piece of advice, um, what I carried from college, if, if Esther knows, I have t-shirts made all the time that say lead, inspire, because at practice on the, on the back of our shorts, we always had a word every year. And um, the one thing I would say that has made me got where I'm at today is um, surrounding myself around the right people that elevate me. And my mom used to always say, you know, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you what you are. And I truly believe that. I have carried myself um, in a professional manner and my, like I said, my teammates and they are my family. And I know Shoot and Touch always used to use the phrase family. And we did that at UMass Lowell. And I've carried that onto the police department with my team. I'm very proud of the Bureau of Community Engagement, my hand-picked officers. And I just say, make sure you surround yourself around people that will elevate you and, and make sure you're around the right people. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Allison. Okay, hey, Nora completely stole mine. Um, I was gonna reference a, a, an accountability group. Um, it's gonna be painful sometimes when you look at your friends and they aren't, and they don't have the same goals that you have and they don't wanna go the same places that you want to go. It's gonna be super hard to weed those people out of your lives. Maybe not completely, but you cannot roll with people who don't have the goals that you have. So keep that in mind. Get your accountability group, people who will hold you accountable to your goals being set. Incredible, both of you, just really, really wise words. Thule? I recently, someone asked me, um, how do you win an unwinnable situation? And they said, rewrite the rules. And I said, yeah. Um, and how many times has someone said, this has been my life and you look at yours and you're like, well, how am I gonna get from where I am to where I wanna be? Um, and so my, my piece of advice to win unwinnable situations is three things, confidence, consistency, and conditioning. Um, and that also applies on the court. You know, stay, stay consistent in what you're doing. It may not be perfect, but stay consistent in the effort condition, try new things, get out of your comfort zone and stay confident because once you do, once you put in the work, um, that's where confidence sets in. So rewrite the rules, um, always stay conditioned, always stay confident and always try to stay consistent. Thank you, Tuli. I'm writing that down. I'm going to use that with my team. Who knew that the, the player would become the teacher? But I wrote that down as well. I got some notes from everything. Allison, <laughs> wow, you guys are amazing. That's awesome. And Esther? 
Um, I would say don't let fear be the thing that holds you back, fear and uncertainty. A lot of times uh, we get, especially when we're young, we get afraid to um, see where our goals can take us or to try. Um, but don't let fear be the reason why you don't succeed. Don't let fear be the reason why you don't, um, you know, try out for a team or, you know, take a test or, you know, try and, and, and uh, enroll in this college. Uh, give it a chance, believe in yourself, trust yourself and be your biggest fan and your biggest advocate. And, and ultimately, you'll never really lose if you overcome fear by trying. Absolutely. And I would just echo Esther by saying, growing pains are a real thing and growth hurts. Um, but the best part about growth is you get stretched and you, you know, you learn something while you're away. And when you come back, you're better for it. So don't run from it. Don't let fear drive you away. Um, push yourself and you will become a better version of yourself. Thank you guys. I can't tell you how filled I am and I'm gonna kick this over to Britt, but just from the bottom of my heart, um, Shooting Touch family, thank you all so much for this incredible opportunity. Um, I will never forget this, my first time moderating, but I couldn't have imagined, uh, you know, kind of doing this for a first time with any other group. So I appreciate your, um, your patience, your respect, and for your buy-in, so thank you. That, I just want to take a, a minute and thank, on behalf of all of Shooting Touch, our amazing panel and our incredible moderator, the time and energy and effort that each of you gave, it shows exactly why you are all in the positions that you are. And just the amount of love that you poured into tonight, it truly made this night so special for all of us. Um, incredibly valuable. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. Um, thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful night.